Well, folks, another chilly day, and uh, this would be the second one in the series, so I don't know who hasn't been here. I wasn't here last week. I was a coward. So anyway, uh, the, continuing on. Next week, uh, medicinal plant gardens, and uh, it's kind of going to go with what we'll be here today a little bit because he has some stuff to do with native lands. So, um, Thad's gone, in case you hadn't figured that out. Uh, so today, Courtney Masterson is the owner and operator and ecologist of Native Lands, LLC, and Ecology Restoration and Native Landscaping Company based out of Lawrence. Um, community education and outreach has been one of the main things of, of their business. Uh, Courtney has been a part of the conservation community in Kansas City for over a decade as a volunteer, a researcher, and as a restoration ecologist. She has a master's degree in ecology and environmental biology at the University of Kansas. And with that introduction, I'm going to let Courtney hopefully enlighten us. She has enlightened me with my query, I will say that. Not necessarily all good, but I'm working at it. Thank you, Floyd. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I wore the skirt so I could um, As Floyd said, my name is Courtney. Call me Courtney. Um, and please feel free to ask questions during my talk. It's a little short on purpose. I'm more of an interactive um, educator. So um, by no means do we stand on, a, um, on strict rules and formality today. Um, my slide advancer is not working, so please be patient. Uh, today I'll be talking with you. Can you hear me with my mask on? Okay, great. Um, today I'll be talking with you about the ecosystems native to our region, what's going on with them right now, and uh, the restoration projects that we are working on in our area. So let's see if I can uh, get this thing to do. There we go. So I work outside every day, including today and yesterday. Um, my job entails knowing plants at all part of the year, um, and my research focused heavily on the interaction between plants and animals. So uh, my research at KU was on the effects of white-tailed deer um, herbivory, so the damage from white-tailed deer on native plant species. So um, I spent a lot of time in observation of plants and animals, and that means even in the winter I'm out there. Um, so if you're not aware, uh, this group would know, but I like to include this definition. What an ecologist does is studies the, study these relationships between organisms within an ecosystem. Um, and I specialize in plant-animal interaction. So Kansas is native to more than 2,000 species of plants um, and many, many non-native species of plants. Um, this is a beautiful picture of Kanza. I'm sure many of you have been there. And when you simplify which ecosystems you'll find in Kansas, and I'm going sp to sp spend most of my time talking about northeastern Kansas today, but this is true across the state. Um, we have grassland or prairie uh, ecosystems, forest ecosystems, simplified down past Dan, to deciduous forests. Um, the ecotone or the edge between those ecosystems, and you could add ecotone between these ecosystems and parking lots, <laughs> uh, lawns, right, to that category, and then wetland spaces. Um, so these ecosystems are, uh, over the past 150 years or so have experienced great change. Um, we know prairie and high quality forests to have been greatly reduced in presence, especially in our uh, heavily developed spaces like northeastern Kansas. Um, but our wetlands are also undergoing great loss. While we see um, rapid growth in forested areas and edges, right, so as ecosystems are fragmented, we know uh, a little bit about surface area from our intro biology classes, right? So the smaller the ecosystem, the more edge there is um, uh, in proportion, right? So the smaller our ecosystems become, the edgier they become, which is part of what made my research so interesting, because deer love edges. So um, Pop Rock Prairie 
is considered a mega diverse ecosystem, and that just means um, in comparison to other ecosystems, there's more diversity in a, a square meter than you would expect. Um, the ecosystem is entirely dependent on disturbance, and that can take a lot of different forms, you know, burning, um, historically, um, hanging, grazing, mowing. <laughs> People get really creative nowadays um, on how they disturb their prairie spaces. But even our forest ecosystems are dependent on disturbance to some degree. And the prairie would have covered most of our state and most of the Midwest. So about 170 million acres is the estimate for how expansive it was historically. Um, so at this point, we're down across the entire original range to less than 4%. And you'll hear a lot of this from Kelly next week, too. Um, this is sort of our, our sad, soppy, so, soppy tale <laughs> that we have to tell at the beginning of every talk to impress on, uh, on our listeners um, why this work is important. Um, in our county, it's much lower than 4% left, but across the entire ecosystem, there's about 4% left. Um, and that's caused agencies and nonprofits like um, Nature Conservancy to define it as functionally extinct. So it no longer functions as a prairie would have historically for a lot of reasons. So everything from seed dispersal to um, reproduction to um, the interactions between animals and plants, those systems have all broken down. Um, so in Douglas County, over 90% of this county would have been prairie. Um, we're down to less than 1% of our prairie. Um, the story is very similar for our deciduous forest spaces. There would absolutely have been really nice forest here. And if you've been lucky enough to visit either private land um, along waterways, some folks still have a little bit of nice forest left. Um, but our real gem is Baldwin Woods near Baldwin City. Um, there's a few different tracks there owned and operated, operated, <laughs> managed by KU field station staff. And those are some really beautiful forests there. But that's pretty much all we have left. I'm going to show some maps um, of historic land cover, but they're going to be too small from this TV. So I'm going to share these slides. Um, but you kind of get the idea. Um, generally, what this map shows is that. Um, we're seeing an increase of forest cover, but not the right kind of forest. So we're seeing a lot of early successional forest growth, and a lot of non-native tree um, presence increase, um, and we're not seeing high quality forest um, where it would have been, and we're not seeing prairie anymore. So everywhere that's neon green, which is, I know, tough to see, is where we see forest now. This map was created by Kansas Biological Survey, to um, show the difference between where forest would have been and where it is now. But I can interpret this for, me, for you since it's so tiny. Um, the uh, forest in our county historically would have embraced the waterways. So we would have seen anywhere between about a quarter mile to a mile of riparian deciduous forest buffering the Kansas River and the Wakarusa River. Um, Clinton Reservoir wasn't there, <laughs> so there would have been a really nice forest there. Um, and everything else would have been wetland or prairie. So um, all that green that's away from where our waterways are um, would have been prairie, with the exception of a, some small um, islands like Baldwin Woods would have been forest historically. So <laughs> these tiny little dots, you can't even see them from there, but you can't see them up close either. I can barely see them. That's all that's left of our high quality ecosystems in the county. So um, definitely less than a percent of what was left, or, or what was there originally. And so when we think of ecosystem loss, we have to find a way to describe to people um, why we care about the loss of these ecosystems. We certainly have um, interactions with wildlife in our own yards, in our um, business spaces. I'm sure there's interactions with wildlife even in the church lot here, but um, what do these ecosystems provide that's different than a space like this provides? Um, and we define those with a term called ecosystem services, but it's a little bit controversial, so you'll see me sort of hedging around it. That's certainly the human perspective, to think of an ecosystem providing services. 
um, to us. Um, but there's, you know, these same services are provided to wildlife. So I'll summarize these since we um, are, it's a little tiny. So more modern perspectives on ecosystem services are broken down into four categories of supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural resources. Anything you can think of um, in your life, even the building we are in today, the medicine that you take every morning, the clothes you're wearing, these are all things that ecosystems provide us, along with water quality, soil quality, air quality. Um, and to me, my most passionate service is home for our wildlife, right? For our plants. Um, but they, the ecosystems do pretty much everything for us. Um, and we, if, if for no other reason, that's a good reason to protect them. Um, so, as I was saying, fragmented ecosystems function very differently than our expansive original ecosystems. Um, and a lot of that has to do with harsh transitions from small ecosystem spaces um, from one island to another. Um, so to get from Aiken Prairie to the next high quality remnant prairie, um, which is Rockefeller Prairie, um, you know, it's 10, 15 miles of farmland, roads, uh, city, um, car traffic. It's tough to go from a really high quality remnant to a really high quality remnant um, in today's world. And it makes it really difficult for people like me to manage those spaces. I have to think about people's backyards, um, people's kids, um, people's work schedules, um, the fire department. <laughs> I have to think about all these things. Then I have to think about how I can protect the animals and plants while I'm doing my work. Um, and fire, just everything. Fire dynamics are different in a small prairie. When I burn a, a one acre prairie, it's gonna burn very differently than Kansa, which burns very differently than 170 million acres <laughs> would have burned when it was on fire. So um, it just makes taking care of those spaces very difficult. Um, this is a comparison between, here, okay. This is a comparison between uh, fragments of prairie in urban spaces and what we think of as our gem prairies like Kansa or Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. I did a lot of my research in a prairie in Shawnee Mission Park called Og Prairie. Highly recommend visiting, it's beautiful. Um, but Og Prairie is that tiny little island in the shape of Italy, it's a boot-shaped prairie in Shawnee Mission Park. These are the same scale. So that's Og Prairie versus the same scale space of Kansa Prairie. Um, Kansas still has its own disturbances um, that keep it from functioning the same way as we would have seen prairies function historically. But um, it's going to behave a lot more like a prairie. The species will interact much more similarly to what we would have seen historically than in a tiny little island locked in into some neighborhoods in a big, in a big disturbed space like uh, Lenexa, Kansas. <laughs> but still really cool to see. And then in our own backyard, I know none of us were here 200 years ago, but <laughs> when KU was formed, that entire Mount Oread was prairie. So um, that's a great difference from what we see today, right? And our programs focus heavily on planting trees on Mount Oread. Um, we celebrate our trees, trees are great things. <laughs> but um, I have to tell you, I get a little bit Whew. nervous every time they plant more trees on Mount Maria. <laughs> I'd much rather see them planting prairie up there. But there's very little left of prairie on Mount Maria. If you haven't visited, um, Prairie Acre is the name of the little prairie patch that's public on KU campus. It's not an acre, it's a third of an acre. It barely functions and requires intensive care to stay open. You can see that's all that there is there, that little stone wall protecting prairie acre. We have found a couple of other tiny remnant prairies on campus, but they're currently not accessible to the public, not safely. Um, but we're working on hopefully adding some trail systems and working on opening them up um, through student labor. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. And teaching courses that on applied ecological restoration, if we can. We're looking for funding for that. Um, so that the students can be part of that process of finding prairies, 
opening them back up, and then providing public access and education to those spaces. So if you see any efforts to do that work, please support them, at least with your words, if not in any way that you can. Um, so I think I've impressed upon you the importance of prairie and that it's home to a great number of species. And I had to do, I don't know, five years ago, I did a little bit of personal research on how many of our endangered species listed organisms depend on our native ecosystems. All of them do. And many of them depend on prairie. Uh, certainly the two plant species that are part of the Endangered Species Act are dependent on prairie. They're both prairie endemic species. Uh, the prairie orchid and Mead's milkweed. If you go to um, Rockefeller Prairie, there are a few hundred stems of Mead's milkweed there. They're not right on the edge of the trail though, but they're there, so you can be in their presence. And if you work with KU field station staff, I bet they could take you to see them. They're gorgeous. But you can sort of tell when you're in their presence why they're <laughs> endangered. Um, they are not very showy and certainly not very tough. Um, but that's them in the bottom right corner there. And the monarch, despite it not really, you know, kind of being listed or not really listed or you know, being, we're fighting to list it and then, then we have good years and bad years for monarchs, they're having an okay time right now. <laughs> um, they are not on the list for Kansas because they don't live here. They just pass through. They're migrants, but I still consider them part of our species to protect in Kansas. Right. We're very important to them. So what can we do? Um, I base my entire career off of what can I do <laughs> to protect these spaces. Um, the most important thing we can do is connect people back to nature, and that's why I'm, I give these talks. That's why we're here today together. Um, identify, protect, and conserve what we have left. Um, so the work that Kansas Biological Survey is doing to locate these prairies, work with landowners to educate them on why they're important and protect them um, is very, very important. And then um, something that takes up a lot of space in my heart and mind right now is creating more of these spaces, but also protecting, truly protecting, managing the spaces we have left. Not just finding them and legally protecting them, but actually taking care of them. And that's something we're not really doing very well in uh, most of Kansas right now. So I'm working with um, a lot of municipalities to create policy that will enable parks departments and um, neighborhood associations and um, nonprofits to actually do physical work in these spaces. Um, so you've probably gleaned from what I've said so far what restoration is, but by definition, you're restoring functionality and assisting um, in, in, the, uh, in the restoration of that functionality of an ecosystem. So these will be spaces that have been degraded in some way, and that means anything from what we see at Rockefeller, which has its own restoration issues, to um, what we see at Floyd's house, right? where um, there's big woody issues, or there's invasive species issues, like in my prairie. Um, or maybe there's hardly any prairie to be seen at all. Maybe it's a red, red cedar field. <laughs> and we have to start from what looks like a forest and pull it back to prairie. Um, and I talk about prairie a lot because I spend a lot of time there, but forests have their own restoration concerns. Wetlands certainly do. Um, Playa lakes, all of our little ecosystem types have their own restoration concerns. So there's something to do in every part of Kansas. Um, uh, so um, we start restoration work by determining what's there, what's missing, um, what's there that shouldn't be there, <laughs> and um, how are we going to determine if we've been successful from point A to point B. And that last point is important because most of our work is done through grant funding or research funding. Um, so we have to be able to define to the average person or to our funders that we've made a difference and that we expect the trajectory to be positive over time. Um, and that's where my background in research comes in handy and working with entities like grad students at KU to do research or KBS or even City of Lawrence or the county to measure our success is really important. And 
that brings us back to why remnants are important. Because when I'm restoring a space or building a new space, I use the remnants and the variables that make that remnant. Um, you know, what's the soil like? Uh, what's the moisture like? Um, what's the edge like? To inform and inspire what we do in these spaces that we're trying to restore or build. And so I need these remnant ecosystems as my inspiration and my teacher in what I'll do next. So um, it is not our goal to recreate Kanza or Tallgrass Prairie um, nature preserve or uh, national preserve uh, here. I, that's impossible. I would have to knock down the whole city of Lawrence. <laughs> that's not my intention. Um, but rather to create, to reproduce, or to simulate the connectivity, the connectivity of a space that's expansive like that. So um, I use the term habitat networks to describe what we're trying to do, which is a nice term because it immediately sparks uh, in your imagination um, connections between native spaces. Um, and that can look like a lot of different things. And our restorations take the form of everything from many hundreds of acres to pots on people's porches. And I know that sounds silly, that a little pot could be a restoration, but it's very important that there's milkweed at every certain amount of every distance, that, you know, that a monarch can go from one space to another, that there's um, as much diversity um, in these islands as possible. Um, I'm particularly fond of blue sage, for instance, which is a native salvia to the prairie. And there's a bee called the blue sage bee who's dependent on this species. So almost every garden in full sun that I plant, I put blue sage in it because that bee can only fly a half a mile. If you're that bee and there's no blue sage within half a mile of where you live, you're stuck. So we want to give those animals the opportunity to move and to thrive. And we do that at every scale. And research shows that no matter the size of your restoration, no matter the size of your native planting, they're important and they're used. So everything from the, the little pond in your neighborhood that supports the duck population and all the aquatic species that live there, um, you know, to these massive spaces like Kanza are very important. And um, as I said, I, when I think about where we choose restoration spaces, um, we target everything from, we're a very tiny business. <laughs> we work everywhere from Kansa, um, Foothills, all the way to Raymore, Missouri. And uh, um, that means that when I take on a project, a public project anyway, um, I think about how it fits into that network. And if it's a space where we are needed, because we're so small, I can't take every project and we have to make a little bit of money so that I can pay my mortgage. <laughs> so we have to think strategically about what we do, but we also work with partners to identify spaces that, uh, especially those spaces that service ecosystems where there's not any healthy ecosystems currently. There's really nice examples of habitat networks in other countries um, and other regions of the world. So if you like to Google, if you're a, a computer researcher, um, check out the European Green Belt, which is really fascinating um, space that's um, arisen from the Berlin Wall, actually. So the space that encompasses the wall, um, not only did they tear it down, thank goodness for that, but they also converted that space to um, wildlife corridors. And um, that Green Belt strip runs 5,000 miles. 5,000 miles of space for wildlife to pass through that entire section of the country, of, of the world, <laughs> of the region, right? That's a pretty nice uh, goal. I'd, <laughs> I'd like to just get a, a belt running through Lawrence. Um, <laughs> that'd be really nice. And there are some more local examples. If you look at the Turkey Creek um, restoration work that Johnson County, Wyandotte County, and Johnson County, Missouri collaborate on, there's a really nice green belt that runs through those counties along Turkey Creek. It's a big buffer in a space that makes sense. We can't build on top of a creek anyway. Um, so why not buffer it with natural area, put a trail in there, and let wildlife use that space. And that's what they've done. And they continue to expand that um, every year. It's very, very cool. 
Where is the Turkey Creek? Um, the most easy access to it is several of the park systems in Johnson County. Um, it's a long hike bike trail and it's paved for the most part. Um, there's a couple of parks um, in Lenexa um, where you can hop on the Turkey Creek Trail. I'm trying to remember. Blackfoot Park is one. Um, but you, I would Google it and look for the park entrances. Um, but there's several, and you can hop on it in Missouri as well. Um, it's a really beautiful, lots of money, paved, very wide trail. Um, so it's a little different than your typical nature trail. <laughs> but you do still see quite a lot of wildlife there. And what's neat about it is they focus a lot of their restoration energy on that space because they've invested so much in it. So a lot of the honeysuckle has been pushed back. A lot of the non-native species have been removed. They're doing a lot of restoration work to put native ecosystems back in those spaces. Um, so I was surprised the other day because someone congratulated me on the anniversary of our business forming. I had completely forgotten. Apparently I formed <laughs> this business around this time in 2015 and its original goal was to create um, native seed production and we still struggle with there being enough native seed for all the projects that we do um, at least affordably and but now we've taken this form which i really love uh, which includes native seed production but is much broader um, we've been doing this for about seven years but full time for the last five and or so uh, and that was because I was able to um, step away from my work with Kansas Biological Survey and um, work full time on restoration projects that were funded. Um, we received funding for a project I'm going to describe to you here in a moment, um, and it gave me sort of that freedom to take this full time. And our work is first and foremost, and I should put this first, community work. So. I can't do my restoration work without the community. The entire model is based on uh, community volunteerism and education. Um, and then protecting the spaces, which should be number one, but I can't do it without them. So, um, And then building new spaces where um, everything native has been lost. Um, and providing education to anyone who steps into that space with us. And we invite everyone to come, including you know, uh, parks workers, state agencies like Wildlife and Parks, uh, uh, you know, help the health department, um, um, and, and most importantly, the neighborhood, the folks in the neighborhood of the space that we're restoring, and the students who visit those spaces. Um, so we start out by finding a space, as I described before. Where is our help needed the most? And there's a lot of variables that go into that, right? Uh, we're not going to be able to get funding if it's not a visible space. Um, it's important to us that it's a publicly accessible space because, as I said, we do this work with the community. Um, and it needs to be a space where I can safely provide education and install native species that will be protected for the long term, protecting our funders' investment, essentially. But beyond that, because I care about these spaces an awful lot. So one of the spaces we're trying to get funding for now is Burroughs Creek. Um, and I'll describe why here in a minute. Um, once we have identified a space that we would like to protect, we start looking for collaborators. We can't do our work without our partners either. Um, when I say we're small, we're really small. <laughs> it's just myself and my husband came on full time in June, which is wonderful. And then a seasonal staff of young people and, and anyone who wants to volunteer, of course, but a seasonal staff usually of students who are interested in, in joining this field and getting um, training. So we bring uh, in a lot of KU students, a lot of UMKC students, um, Johnson County Community College students, any, any in high school students, uh, a lot of the Free State and, um, and Lawrence High kids come and work with us. Um, and we are empowered by them, really, and their, their energy and their enthusiasm. But we also work with state agencies, nonprofits, um, Anyone who's a stakeholder in that space, we try to bring to the table. It's very important. And Burroughs Creek I, was identified as an important space to restore. Honestly, it was my backyard. I used to live um, right in front of it um, at 14th and Pennsylvania. If you're familiar with East Lawrence, I think everyone who lives there feels Burroughs Creek um, for a lot of reasons. The wildlife 
use it as a corridor. Uh, it is a wildlife corridor through the city, whether we want it to be or not. <laughs> it's important for them to access water, right? But also, anytime it rains, it floods. That thing is, it's such a, it's volatile um, in that it's not able to absorb water the way it would have historically. Um, it's mowed, it's dredged, it's disturbed all the time and not in the kind of way that we want things to be disturbed. But it's also a really cool habitat for turtles and crayfish and foxes and coyotes. Um, but those, those animals are displaced every time we do something to try to protect our uh, developed spaces, right? Um, so we've been lucky to have really wonderful conversations on site and some work has been done um, with a lot of partnership age, uh, uh, groups, um, KU and the city and stormwater, um, big state agencies like Wildlife and Parks, Evergy now, it wasn't Evergy when we started this conversation, right? Um, even KU Architecture and the Neighborhood Association. Um, so there's a huge <coughs> list of interested parties, but we've been trying for about four years and haven't been able to get funding for this project. It's very difficult to find money for our restoration work. Uh, especially through the model that we use. Yes, ma'am. Is the creek right along the trail? Yes. So it's most visible from uh, um, 13th to 11th Street, um, where there's a trail system running along it. Um, but it also runs in through backyards and, and you know in between houses. Um, I think it comes out around uh, 20, 20 something. The, it, the spring comes up out of the ground, and very quickly. Um, if you can picture it, um, it goes, it dump, dumps into the Kansas River very quickly. So it's not a, um, a long creek, um, but it's a very disturbed space. And it has a lot of pollutants, a lot of soil disturbance. Um, anything that folks do in their backyard ends up in that creek. A lot of trash. Um, and that all ends up in the Kansas River. And I don't know if you know or if you've had Don uh, Bueller, our river keeper, to speak. The Kansas River is the drinking source for 800,000 Kansans. And that's just Kansans, right? And we very quickly get into Kansas City um, and are part of the water system for Kansas City and beyond. So if we think about it from our perspective, we want people to have clean water, but if it's affecting our water, it's affecting every organism that uses that space. And Burroughs Creek is, is just one example of one of the many tributaries that are going through this kind of um, troublesome uh, disturbance all the time. Um, so we would really love to restore that. There's some pretty pictures of my time there. And um, Jerry Jost was kind enough, from Kansas Land Trust was kind enough to get us some um, nice drone shots of it. You can tell, and when you see these closer, you can tell it's mowed all the time. It's dredged all the time because of sedimentation and blockage and flooding. Um, this should be a wet prairie space, maybe some small wetland spaces. There would have been trees there. Um, there's a lot of things missing, but what it is really is either mud or mowed grass. Those are sort of the two. <laughs> if it's dry enough to mow, they mow it. If not, it's just sort of a bog. Um, creates all sorts of issues. Flooding is something I keep saying, but mosquitoes, um, you know, a lot of dangerous situations when you can't manage an ecosystem like that that's right behind schools and houses and parks. So when we identify a space like Burroughs, we start looking for funding. There's a, only a few places we can look. Um, in our area, we get a lot of our funding from um, the county. Uh, and they, they, thankfully, there is a, a little pot of money for that. Um, we get a lot of money from community foundations. But then we look for larger entities. We just received funding for a project I'll tell you about in a minute from um, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, which is really great for us to be able to bring national money to our communities. But for the most part, we just have to ask a few parties and hope that we get funded. Um, and if not, just keep trying. We don't give up on a space. We just do our best to write new grants every year. This is my grant writing season, so I'm spending a lot of my time at the computer. <laughs> and we turn to our partners and those folks that inspire us. So I am, I consider myself a direct descendant of the work that's being done at Kansas City Wildlands in Kansas City. Um, that group does a lot of the similar work to what we do, 
Um, but they they do restoration work with you know volunteer soldiers on park owned land, um, so it's all publicly accessible. And they focus a lot on honeysuckle removal and seed collection. And the seed collection directly feeds new prairies, which is really cool. Uh, but here in Lawrence, we work with Grass and Heritage Foundation a lot. We work with Friends of the Cop a lot. Um, and we try to work with our parks departments and the state agencies that you can really feel in Lawrence. We, uh, because of where Wildlife and Parks is located in Topeka, and a lot of their staff live here in Lawrence, we feel them a lot more than you do in other parts of the state. Um, we also work with some of the other Kansas City nonprofits and Missouri nonprofits. Definitely check out those folks who are doing this work on the ground. So there's a, a little bit different assemblage of folks as you go from one city to the next. But we're, there's a lot of a lot of us are doing all you know all the work together, um, and I, I love that. It's like a family. It's not a very big community. They're doing some really amazing work. Where is Heartland? Located? Heartland Conservation Alliance. They are in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and they just had a change to their director, um, so they, they're hiring a new executive director, but they are doing really amazing things to protect uh, the Blue River in Kansas City. That's their major focus, which is actually a pretty expansive space, running from the Kansas side to the Missouri side. Um, it's very similar to the story of protecting the Kansas River, but they're doing Blue River work, which is kind of overlaps. That's why we work with them so much. So our first restoration project that was funded that allowed us to take the business full time was the riverbank restoration in North Lawrence. So if you use the 8th Street boat ramp or the Lawrence Mountain Bike Trail there, um, then you've seen this work. And we were able to um, protect quite a bit of space there. Our partners were Friends of the Cobb, um, the city, city land, um, the Mountain Bike Club. And we originally pulled Kent's Forest Service on, but um, they weren't able to interact much with that project. But we did have a state partner <laughs> at one point. Um, you can't see this, but you, the riverbank restoration is well within um, the space where we would have seen forest buffer the Kansas River. It's not nice forest now, and the space where that restoration occurs was farmland for a long time. Most of the space we were restoring was actually sort of the farm dump site. A lot of trash. Um, things buried in there we can't get out, cars and bed frames. And, but <laughs> um, thankfully, the Mountain Bike Club has done a fantastic job of creating and maintaining a trail system there. Um, but they were really, they are continually struggling with the forest scooping soil, sand really, out from underneath that trail system and the trail falling into the river. Um, so one of the ways to protect trail systems is by um, restoring the deep-rooted native plants that belong there, um, bringing wildlife back to the space, bringing attention back to the space to support this nonprofit that runs solely on volunteerism. Um, and of course, Friends of the Caw has a vested interest in this space, um, given that they're trying to protect the water of the Kansas River and its banks. So this project ran for two years, and its goal was the restoration, first and foremost, but also to get people out on the river and into that space and to provide education to our local schools. So we were able to use the funding from the county to do, to meet all of these goals. This is a massive list of things that we achieved. But to summarize, um, we restored about five acres, increased the diversity of the site by over 50 species of native plants, immediately observed wildlife interactions there that were not happening before we showed up, which is wonderful. We had hundreds of volunteers, thousands of hours spent on site, um, and ultimately everybody had a really great time and we did something that felt really good and that hopefully will last a long time. Um, we were able to provide training to the Mountain Bike Club because this is their work um, to help them recognize non-native species and the value of native species and why we do what we do. Um, and they gathered some of that information and they use those skill sets now in their work to restore that prairie. Um, and we hope to kind of keep working there as much as we can. There's no more funding. <laughs> but we step in and, and work with the city on management concerns there. And the Mountain Bike Club checks in all the time on, on what they're doing to continue that restoration work. So it's been a really successful um, experience and was the inspiration for us to continue. Um, 
we had several classes come out. We partnered closely with Bob Hagen's field ecology class at KU. If you haven't met Bob, you should. He's fantastic. Um, he sort of spearheads all of the outreach for the, the science departments for KU. And uh, so his students actually set up a research project and continued to collect data there, which is very cool. And we had youth groups from Topeka Zoo and all the local schools came out um, to learn about ecology on site, what was important about that space, and also to um, plant wildflowers and trees. So all of them have a physical investment in that project as well. Um, this is very difficult to see, even if it was bigger, but I want to describe to you what the difference is here. This is my before and after picture. It looks the same if you're, not, <laughs> if you're not sure what you're looking at. So on the left, what we started with was an understory of winter creeper. If you don't know winter creeper, one day you will. We're all going to feel winter creeper. But basically it is a vine, a woody vine, that is always green no matter the time of year. I could go out there now and it's green. Um, it's waxy. It's not food for any of our native wildlife or any wildlife that I know of um, in, in fact, that visits us here in Kansas. Um, and it doesn't allow, it grows in so densely, which is why it's here. It grows in so densely that nothing can grow through it. Fantastic lawn replacement. <laughs> um, it's a really great garden plant because nothing else can get in there. You don't have to weed it. Um, and you don't have to take care of it. But that means it's actually really great at invading natural areas. What it's done at the mountain bike trail is create an impenetrable mat, which reduces tree recruitment, so there's no new trees, um, to down to essentially nothing. There's no baby trees, um, and it doesn't allow any of the wildflowers or grasses or sedges to grow either. So you have one species on the ground, and then what's towering above it is poison ivy. So it's just, there's, there's old trees that are dying, it's sort of sad, but trees don't live forever, poison ivy, and then winter creeper. And that's what that whole first five acres of that trail system looked like. We worked with volunteers to peel up that mat. It's really like astroturf, only worse. But peel up that plastic-like plant multiple times. Because you can't use herbicide on it, it doesn't respond to herbicide. Um, not that we try to blast herbicide everywhere, especially by water, but you get what I mean. But we didn't have a lot of options. So we were peeling it, rolling it like an old carpet off of the forest floor, planting native species underneath it, planting trees, planting wildflowers, and then um, cutting back the poison ivy from the trail system. It's a native species. We don't try to eradicate poison ivy, but we do push it back. It's not fun to be on a bike or a trail and have poison ivy rubbing you <laughs> on your arms or catching you in the leg. Um, so the difference between these two is on the right, if you can see the fine detail, that winter creeper's gone. We have native grasses and sedges and wildflowers back there. We have something blooming all the time in those first five acres. There's native food for forage in that space, which is sort of a, a side passion of mine, that we should be able to return to these ecosystems for the things that native folks have been utilizing these spaces for for thousands of years. Uh, there should be nuts and berries. There should be fiber there. There should be wood there. Um, and a, the trajectory it was on before, that was not going to be possible. Uh, so we're really excited about what happens there. And this year, we are wrapping up two restoration projects that I'll talk about. We are continuing one that started last year, and then we're starting a new one. So I'll try to go quickly here. Um, so the Eudora Boat Ramp Restoration is in is right on the Wakarusa River, right before it falls into the Kansas River. And it, um, you can see, hopefully, that um, the Wakarusa River doesn't have that buffer either that we expect rivers to have. Very, very narrow strip of forest around the Wakarusa River, and the rest of it is either going to be um, heavily managed agricultural land, um, disturbed, tilled, um, regularly, and then the city of Eudora sits right up against Wakarusa River. So um, what we're left with is just a tiny patch of land at the boat ramp, and in that space we're going to do the best we can to get native prairie growing there again, um, add bioswales, which are just 
micro wetlands, essentially, to handle the stormwater that runs off of the impervious surfaces of Eudora, and then to restore native species to the forest at that space. It's a much smaller project than the um, 8th Street Boat Ramp project was, but still important. And we are starting to see a different population of volunteers come out, City of Lawrence residents, um, and um, different interest groups, Boy Scouts, and um, hunting groups, which is an interesting population to have come to these. I'm excited they're there. Um, but certainly you can't hunt there, so they're just giving of themselves, which is wonderful. And then we are wrapping up Blackjack Battlefield as well. This will be our last season there. We've been there for a year and a half. Um, that's a collaboration with Grassland Heritage Foundation. If you haven't been to the site, it is fascinating. Um, and there's a real sort of a heavier saturation of natural areas there. You see more prairie in that space, more really nice older growth wood, wooded areas. And then the cool interaction between human historic sites. Um, so, you know, obviously the battlefield site itself, the maple grove, um, the old farmhouses, the old structures, um, the old monuments that we can observe in Baldwin, all very fascinating. Definitely spend time there. I'm sure many of you have. Um, but our work there focused on trying to push the woody encroachment out of the prairie. So I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but over the course of 30 years, the prairie there was swallowed up by early successional trees, young trees that don't provide the resources to wildlife that an old growth forest would. So we went from a, you know, couple dozen acres of prairie there um, on the site um, to just just a small amount, just about eight acres or so of prairie in that space. So we are working to start burning it again, push the invasive species out, and we're planting some new prairie at the parking lot. That'll be the first thing you see when you visit that space. And then check out Ivanwood Prairie across the street. If you drive all the way out there, Check out that prairie, it's beautiful. And it is the inspiration for what we're doing at Blackjack. It's the best uh, material that we can get, truly. You would have expected those prairies to interact with each other. Um, so we use seeds from that space, we use those seeds to grow up some plants, to the best of our ability, and certainly we use it as education for what we're trying to do across the street. Um, I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna go quickly here. We have two work days coming up really soon on Blackjack um, Restoration Project. Um, on the 22nd of this month, so just in a few days, we have a seed cleaning work day at a really cool site. Johnson County Parks loaned out um, what's called the Block Barn there. It's the house, really. <laughs> it's a house that someone donated to Johnson County Parks, but it's nestled in a prairie. It's really rural, it's really beautiful. And we get together and we clean seeds. And then soon after that, we go out and disperse the seeds the way nature would um, in the middle of winter. It's really very feel-good work. Uh, and then in May, I think, we start our restoration work there again. We're working with Lawrence Parks and um, Kent's Biological Survey to restore a portion of Mutt Run near Clinton Lake. So if you have a dog, you've been there. I have, don't have a dog, and I've been there. I like to run with the dogs. They're fun. Um, so it's a wild pack. Of dogs. Um, so this space here, where the yellow box is, is what we're restoring. It's about 11 acres. It was, just a very short time ago, uh, mostly Cerecia lespedeza, which is a terrible noxious weed and difficult to get rid of. We're working with the Parks Department and the survey to um, manage that species and add native plants back. So we burned it for the first time in a very long time. Um, about a month and a half ago, and we'll be seeding it this winter. So hopefully, um, in about six months or so, you'll start to see some wildflowers there again. It'll be really beautiful. Definitely visit. Let the parks department know that you like it, and hopefully they'll do some more. <laughs> we're just gonna, we're encouraging them to learn how to treat their spaces like prairie or woodland again, not parks, um, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, right? We can still enjoy this. It'll just be not a mode space. And then finally, our new project, I'm very excited about, is a restoration at Paw River State Park, which if you're not familiar with the space, it's next door to the governor's mansion there at Cedar Crest. There's this large, beautiful park um, that's very steeply sloped down to the Kansas River. There's a lot of really wonderful parks, or uh, parks, uh, trails there. Um, 
and some really cool native species there. But in the space that we're planning to restore, there um, isn't a whole lot left that's of interest to wildlife. So there's a large, a 10 acre approximately, grassy open space that's mostly non-native species. We're gonna return that to prairie. And then the forest, the riparian forest that buffers the river there, will be removing the invasives and adding native species. I'm very excited about this collaboration, not only because it's a big space that the public visits a lot, but also because it's our first nationally funded big grant. It's also um, a space that's right next door to Wildlife and Parks' office, so we get to interact with KDWP a lot on this project. And they own and manage this space, so we're hoping this will be the seed that creates more work like this for our Parks Department um, at a state level. And that just summarizes what I talked about, but hopefully I'll see some of you cleaning seeds with us in January. And please, um, let's quit jabbering and talk about what you're interested in. <laughs> I'd love to save some time to talk with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, we're, looking, we're working at, at planting an area, and, and that we hear that the best thing you can do is to plant a tree. If you're going to plant something that's a plant a tree, if you want to capture carbon. And I'm wondering, is there, do you have any data or sites that you can give us when you give us the slides that we could look at and see what the data is on carbon capture in different types of Absolutely. areas? Absolutely. So I can, I can attempt to do that. Um, honestly, we're a little early. You know, we're in the first decade or so of studying prairies for carbon sequestration, which is sad. <laughs> but we're, we, that work is starting to happen. I can send you some of that research, but the preliminary results are really showing that prairies are doing as much carbon sequestration as trees are. Um, they're just doing it underground instead of up here. So um, both are very valuable. Any native species you plant is a good thing. Depending on the space, maybe plant a tree, but also plant a lot of under, understory stuff. That understory stuff is doing a lot of work. Um, in parking lots, um, parking lot islands trees are valuable because they create shade, which is good for all of us. But also, depending on how the space will be managed, prairie species are uniquely capable of handling the hot, dry intensity of a parking lot. So we do a lot of native prairie plantings. But I'd love to talk about it further and, and share those resources with you. Okay, good. Absolutely. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Yeah. Um, sure. I'll, we'll, we'll do it in order. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to mention about the, the Girl Scout camp, camp head valley on 15th Street. They they have fought 60, 70 years fighting off the developers mm -hmm. to, to build the old houses there. Right. I, and one, I don't know if I mean, they, they're pretty much in the home, but I wonder if they've ever consulted with a few or I uh, know, when they usually just new moving honeysuckle and just finding trees. <laughs> but, yeah. The time itself overrun is so bad there. It is really bad. But they, and they work on it all the time. They're, they're honestly a great model for success once you get inside and see how much work they've been able to do over the last five, ten years um, to push their honeysuckle back. I was um, interacting with them quite a bit. Um, and when Durand, their um, leader, their uh, amazing leader, retired, there's been a little bit of a break there. Um, but I, so I need to rebuild that bridge. But Fantastic work being done there. A lot of native plantings happening there too. They have their own little waterway that they're trying to protect as well. Um, but we do have a relationship. They're doing great things there. But we all, as a community, we need to deal with our honeysuckle. Yeah, so no matter how much they work on it, if we don't all work on it, it's not going to go away. That's for sure. Uh, do you have any questions? Well, I have a couple of questions. Um, you've, you've talked about a lot of specific things. Um, this morning. Is a lot of this on your website? I do not have a website. If okay. you know anyone who likes to do websites, let me know. Uh, who <laughs> likes to work with poor, tiny companies. Um, but my Facebook, our Facebook acts as our website right now. So we okay. do content, I'm sort of constantly posting educational things. Um, but I'm happy to share slides um, so that you can refer back to a lot of this material. And then uh, please consider the door open. 
Um, if Floyd hasn't already, um, I'm sure he would be happy to share my contact info. Um, we, it's difficult to have an internet presence when you're always gone. <laughs> but um, no, so first question, no, I don't have a website. But you, but you do have Facebook. Yes, okay. we have a Facebook page and an Instagram page and hopefully a website. We own a domain. <laughs> I've been paying for it for years. Uh, it just doesn't have anything on it. So you're the you're the Native Lands LLC. Mm -hmm. That's us. My other question is: To what extent do both the city and the county have uh, oh, initiatives or regulations or whatever that support this? I I know that they're they're not opposed to it, but um, it, it seems like there's that uh, as we speak that there's a lot of open space that is disappearing or certainly threatened. Right. Um, Big question. Uh, I'll give you a big gray, non-specific answer, uh, unfortunately. There have been steps forward, but more steps back, unfortunately, in creating policy to protect our natural areas in Lawrence um, and the greater county space. Um, we are trying very hard to work on several different levels to protect natural areas. Um, I'm currently sitting on the uh, weed ordinance reform a subcommittee for the um, Sustainability Advisory Board for the City of Lawrence. Um, meet with county um, folks regularly about trying to protect these natural areas, but um, ultimately there's COVID has been a major barrier, um, which seems silly, right? <laughs> but it is. I mean, we're not meeting, um, new policies aren't being formed or discussed. Uh, very little forward motion has occurred over the last couple of years. Um, before COVID, we had some really nice meetings with both city and county commissioners to add policy that protects natural areas to the, the long-term plan, and it just fell apart. Um, the Kansas Biological Survey does a lot of that work too, advocating for policy to protect natural areas, but there's very little to nothing. There's really nothing that protects these spaces, um, except uh, sort of state and federal laws. Um, EPA restrictions, right? But that's it. We don't have any local restrictions. Um, the creeper you mentioned that you rolled up. Winter there. creeper, yes. Uh, how do you keep it from coming back? Persistence. So what's really wonderful about the um, that particular restoration is it's an old sandbar. So it doesn't feel like it when you're there, but if you walk the trails, they're all sand. So that would have been historically been a sandbar when the river was meandering. So it's a little easier to pull the root system out of that, but you still have to pull it and pull it and pull it. My greatest success, which is sad, but if I, if I owned a space that had it in it, I would be tarping it and leaving it. The best thing you can do is deprive it of everything it needs for as long as possible. Um, the Johnson County Parks Department has had some tiny success with herbicide, but they're saying it takes 18 months to two years to see an effect. So why would I wait two years when I could throw volunteers at it? But as long as I have volunteers, we'll pull it um, to the best of our ability. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have better news <laughs> to share. Yeah. How do you get rid of honeysuckle? Both the, both the creepy kind that, and the, like the Tartarian honeysuckle yeah. that has been around for 50 years. Really oh, it's intense. Um, the way that we deal with it, I mean, everything Native Lands does is sort of low impact, um, boots on the ground, very acute work. Um, so if you, if I was Johnson County Parks and Rec, the way they deal with it is fogging herbicide. I don't, I don't prefer that methodology, especially because so many of our projects are water side, right? We're right next to the river, right next to a creek. Um, we cut and treat the stumps with an herbicide, we're very careful about what we do it. Um, it's very effective. And then we burn what we cut down. Um, when it comes to the vine, that's very difficult to get rid of. A lot of hand pulling and then finding sort of the mother plant, the big vine and treating, cutting and treating that, just pushing it back as much as you can. Keeping berry production to a minimum um, because that's really how it's spreading. Birds will eat the berries whether they're good for them or not <laughs> and move them all over the place. That's how it got here. Um, so uh, just persistence again. Um, but in the spaces where we're able to get in and clear five acres of honeysuckle, when I go back to that space, it's been two years, and the honeysuckle's still gone in that five acres. You just have to be aware of it and start creating that change. If there was an initiative at a county level, especially since we're 
partnered and neighbors with Johnson County, and they're doing so much work. I think we could have a really big impact if we sort of all took it on, which is a lot to ask, but community education is going to be the most important uh, factor there, if we all understand why we're doing it. I had the immense pleasure of finding a bush honeysuckle <laughs> this year. It was that big around, uh, yeah. and it had been growing for that long. And the only reason it hadn't become invasive is that I had the buffer strips on both sides of this, so the burning hit it not let it to spread. <laughs> but I didn't know it was there, and I, we were out looking for bush honeysuckle because it's becoming very much of a problem. And here was this, I'm going, and the young man that I had helping me, Corbin, says, how could you miss that all these years? And I said, <laughs> I have no idea, but there it is. So yeah, anyway, so. You're right. And, and honestly, I, I will add another, my own embarrassing story, given that this is what I do for a living. Um, we just found a, a decent-sized honeysuckle behind our barn that we didn't know was there. And it, it, all it takes is one un noticed plant and it's dropping berries and those seeds last for a long time and they have a really high germination rate so it doesn't take much uh, one um there you know one shrub with berries has thousands of berries on it and about half of those will germinate so it only takes one um to make a real big mess but you know when my husband and i have worked on projects where we were talking about honeysuckle like this you know getting the chainsaw out to cut honeysuckle down um so i mean they, they can range in size um, quite drastically and you know the best time of year to work on it is when they have leaves and no one else does so fall and early spring um, they're still photosynthesizing so the herbicides work and it protects the native plants it's a good time to see them too and winter creeper <laughs> I can work on winter creeper now if I wanted to <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much